Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for joining the webinar. In fact, welcome to the ICPA webinar. This, um, and in fact, welcome to my office. Um, what you can't see is a phalanx of people to my left, uh, banks of computers, just in case you ask me tough questions. Nah, just me, just joking, really. Um, together with my guest, Mr. Richard Sims, we're going to be looking and discussing money laundering, uh, especially the fourth EU money laundering directive, uh, affectionately known as for MLD. Now, I think it's fair to say that there's not been too much publicity about this recently, as I think we've all been fixating on uh, making tax digital, um, which to a degree that's eased a tad as they've put back um, the implementation. And, and I think it's a good time now to refocus on money laundering, and as I say, especially the fourth EU directive, which came in on, I think it's the 26th of June this time. Um, if we get the time and towards the end, we're also going to have a brief look at the wonderful new, I'm going to have to read this, Office for Professional Body Anti-Money Laundering Supervisors, or OPAS. So we're going to have a look at that as well. Um, this webinar hopefully is going to be the first of many where I'm going to be talking with leaders in the field about you know, issues that affect us all as accounts in practice, and I'll be trying to get as much information and help out of my guests as possible. Now today, my guest is fabulous Richard Sims. Uh, Richard's been a long time friend of the ICPA, and as well as being an FCA, which is a licensed insolvency practitioner, operating with his team as uh, FA Sims and partners in Leicester, isn't it, Richard? Yeah, right, in Leicester. Richard, the reason why Richard's here is he's also the MD of the wonderfully named Anti Money Laundering Compliance Company, the AMLCC. Uh, he's a recognised expert in the field of money laundering. Many of you, many of you, will have picked up and attended. Richard's lectures and presentations around the country and within your branch meetings and your institutes, etc., etc. So I'm really pleased to have Richard here helping us out on money laundering. Now, the ICP were in fact one of the very first, I think, Richard, to, to recognise the value of the AMLCC product as a means for accountants to actually control and record their money laundering compliance work. And not only, not only do we fully endorse the product, but we actually give it completely free to every single ICPA member. So, if you're watching this webinar and you are a member, and you haven't started using the product, you can just say, log into the website, log on to the product, and start using it. It really is good, and it will take care of recording all your compliance. If you're not a member, uh, first thing to say is, why on earth not? But if you're not a member, you can get the product. It is available for um, about one, 200 pounds in it, Richard? 197. 197. Guys, even cheaper than I thought. 197 pounds. <laughs> anyway, let's get going. Richard, I just, I'd say, first question up. I want to cover the money laundering landscape we accounts are finding ourselves in now. Um, and I think the best place to start with is the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, which I believe they call that the primary legislation. That's what causes all of this work, isn't it? Um, so what money laundering offences does the Act, the Proceeds of Crime Act, specify? And, and can you tell us what obligations does it impose on us as accountants? Yeah, can you cover that? I think it's important, and hello first of all, it's important to recognise the UK has a very broad approach to money laundering. And so we have what we call an all-crimes policy for anti-money laundering, money laundering effectively. So basically the handling, dealing with, touching, picking up, holding, moving around, any of those things to do with proceeds of crime is going to be classified as money laundering. Oh, yeah. That's principally picked up within section 327, 328, 329 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, which is clear in terms of the offences by, say, handling, holding, possessing, creating, etc., moving around those proceeds of crime. What the Proceeds of Crime Act also talks about is the obligation on the regulated sector, so ourselves, as accountants and bookkeepers in practice, to make sure we make the reports, the suspicious activity reports, under that legislation. We also need to be aware of tipping off, which we'll come back to um, shortly later on. But I think the important thing is to remember that why we're here today is to protect yourselves from the situation of being found to be doing something you shouldn't be doing. Because don't forget, you can quite easily transition from by not maybe being fully compliant, you can suddenly be doing something that actually is helping one of your clients to launder money under the process of the Crime Act, and suddenly you're in the dock next to them as the person assisting in that process, rather than someone who's purely being governed for being compliant with that. 
Food camps, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. So you, you just cover, which is, you know, people have it in their heads about the proceeds of a crime, then, you know, I think you put it in one article, we're not talking about, you know, stashes of cash wadging, wadging all over the place. Uh, it does include simple things like, you know, if someone is not paying the correct tax or over claims a refund, that that is a crime has to be reported. That's what it comes back to this, this all crimes approach. So if we take taxes and talk about here, yeah. tax evasion is a crime, therefore the process of that crime, whether it's a, an extra refund back from HMRC or a reduction in how much you pay to HMRC, would be tax evasion, would be criminal. And that's what the two types. So there's no there's no minimum figure associated with that. So in theory, 50p for that would be something that would be reportable under the process of crime act. There is nowhere that gives any scope to interpret that for themselves, nowhere for you to say, well, I'm not going to report because it's only 50 p Now that may seem very painful, but it's the reality of the situation we find ourselves in this position. So it's about making sure you're looking to consider reports where you need to, you're making those reports to understand what the report should be about, what the content is, and you're comfortable to understand that. So we were just talking earlier, Tony, about the relationship between the account of the bookkeeper and the client. Right. So going back in the past, we would have actually said that was a very close, very yeah. confidential relationship. Discussions would have taken place that would may have been, you might have called off the record conversation potentially. Back in 2007, when we became regulated for anti money laundering, of course, that drove a wedge between the client and the accountant yeah. in that discussion. Because suddenly, you couldn't have those conversations because suddenly you may not be finding information that would be just need to make a report. So that, that's the way it's been created, and that's just to come back to saying protect yourself. Yeah. And as you said, uh, accountants have been around uh, for many years before 2007. It is a wedge that's driven through, and a lot of people found it very difficult at the time. Um, just moving on, Richard, you, you mentioned their suspicious activity, or SARS as we call them. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the SAR, can you, you tell them what information is expected to be included on a suspicious activity report, how they can how you can make one these days, and, and you know, what actually happens to that information once you've made the report. If you can cover that, that'd be cool so we know what's going on. Well I'll kind of, I'll kind of jump back, back to the stage before then and I will answer your, your questions on that one. I think the first thing to understand is why, when would we need yeah. to make a suspicious activity report? And that comes down to this issue about suspicion or grounds of suspicion knowledge or grounds for knowledge that your client is involved in money laundering and so on. Just to define really what that roughly is, which is taking those proceeds of crime and trying to disguise them away from their original criminal activity that led to that proceeds of proceeding. So if you had a situation where you were suspicious of a client who was involved in money laundering, or you had knowledge of that client being involved in money laundering, or in fact you had grounds for either of those. All the crime, yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. when you would be in a situation of having to consider making that report suspicious actions report. What then is a suspicious action report? Just to say before you say that, mm. the, I think the critical word here is suspicious. It's not you have to have absolute certainty uh, of it before you make a yes. report. It is important to remember that it is a suspicion and if you have suspicions make a report. Sorry I just wanted to get that no, I think because it's... no one's expecting us to be Hercule Poirot here and delve into it and go to the end of the river. Absolutely. So there's, there's kind of three levels to that. So we talked about knowledge, suspicion, and the lower level, which doesn't lead to a report, is speculation. And we've had this conversation before, and I know, unfortunately, you can't just report a client because you don't mind them. Yeah. You have to have, you know, have some good reason to make that report. Yeah. But the suspicion or knowledge is what okay. leads you to need to make that report. Now, when you come to make that report, you're looking for the who, what, when, where, how, and why. Who, what, when, where, how, and why, to give information to the National Crime Agency to enable them to establish if it's something they need to investigate in further. So, to make that suspicious, that suspicious activity to report, put the feedback in, to make that star report, generally you go to the National Crime Agency website, the NCA website, uh, top right hand corner, you go and basically register yourself on there, and then you can go from there and suspicious, submit a suspicious activity to report from there. Now, those reporting formats are not fantastic for accountants, they are really drafted for banking in the first place, but Generally, the reports I've made, I've been able to make, I've been able to put enough information on there to evidence the issue I've been trying to address in our report. And that report, the key thing to remember, making that report, is your principal defence under the money laundering regulations. If you made that report, it really is kind of get out of jail free card. But if you made that report, it's going to be very difficult to find you 
and you're doing it wrong if you've made that report, because you have given yourself that defence by having made that report. Okay. Um, what happens to stuff when it gets up there, Richard? I mean, uh, how long... Obviously, certain agencies are able to feed in uh, and, and take information off. Um, what happens? It stay up there, I don't know, five years, ten years, forever? I think you can, and in terms of what information is available for the National Crime Agency, you and I and the members out there, it's very difficult to, to know exactly what the process of that is. It's not very clearly disclosed. What I understand is if the report is the one that requires investigation, it will be passed to the local police force, the area you reported mm -hmm. from. If it is something that is a tax related issue, it will be passed on to HMRC, then it will detect their investigations. And that's as far as we go from there. So there is, I think, frustration amongst some of the supervisors and of course ourselves as well in that information ongoing investigation by the National Crime Agency are not being publicised to us of course to understand about the risks until that's happened. Okay. Uh, if, you can, if you can just cover that, I mean a lot of accountants are concerned that if they make a report they're worried that this would get back to the client or might be the ex-client after you made the report but uh, they're worried about this would get back to the client so there's expectations of anonymity involved in making and you know, also people are concerned about tipping off. So, if you, so, so are we right to expect that reports we made will be kept out of the domain and, and we have a right to expect anonymity? Well, our experience from conversation with, with members in practice basically is that generally they've not heard first of all anything back in relation to the report they've made. So there's been yeah. information in the report and they've satisfied their requirements, nothing's gone any further than that. We have had incidents of members who have had a response from local law enforcement quite quickly, which happened a bit earlier, but I was told to talk um, quite recently over in uh, Ipswich, and they had a, the member said they had put the report in one day, and they had the armed police turn to their offices the day later. It turned out they were actually meant to go to the premises of the client, not British the office of the client, so I think the account was slightly nervous at that point in time when the armed police turned out. That matter was quite quickly dealt with, but one way the point is, nervous yeah, that's right, the armed so, police kicked the door in. Um, well, literally, I think but the, 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 so there is a response, and they are looked at. I don't, don't think they're not looked at, but I think the issue of anonymity, I think, would come up potentially if there was a situation where that may go to court. Now, again, from our discussions with members and from um, talks, people have said they've actually said to law enforcement, we will not be prepared to go to court. We will not do this in court, and so therefore. So, so that's right, and we do expect anonymity, and it should be. Yes, I think, I think it's impossible to say that there's a guarantee now in this anonymity, if I say that properly, and anonymity, because of the fact that it could go to court and it could be a, a bigger issue for me to be aware of. Um, just want to say, regarding the money laundering regulations themselves, uh, everything I've been reading about, from, from what I can see, the drivers of the Proceeds of Crime Act, and they call it the primary legislation, and they say that the money laundering regulations are the secondary legislation that sort of feeds through into it. Um, and tells us how we have to take our work. Is that, is that a reasonable summary? Yeah, I think we would look at the process of crime act the same way where the offences are created. Yeah. Where we talk the, uh, about the sector, about the regulated sector, yeah. which is ourselves and the money on regulations, gives drivers how to go about being compliant oh, okay. with the requirements driven yeah. by the regulations. Uh, um, before we delve into the changes brought by uh, for MLD, um, God, so far we've got four MLD, we've got MTD, we've got all sorts of stuff. There's, there's loads of it in here. Uh, abbreviations. Anyway, before we get on to the four MLD, I just want to cover a real basic, right? As far as accountants are concerned, what is the registration process to register for money laundering purposes? Who do they register with? And you know, if you know, what are the penalties if you fail to register? Do you, can you answer those? So I mean, I'll come back just one stage back to the four MLD, which is yep. just talking about who should be registered. Yep. And now, we're looking here, the definition has been carried through privilege and tax from the Money Order Regulation 2007 to the Money Order Regulation 2017. Is the idea of an external accountant, so someone who's providing accounting services to a third party by way of business whilst continuing that business, so they can pay the accounting work, accounting yeah. bookkeeping work. Well, you've got to get paid, occasionally, so. Occasionally. Well, you should know, it's an high fee. So, the subject practice is also covered in there. I say external accountant, you've got the tax advisor, and you've got the auditors, basically tax the auditors. Bookkeepers. So you have the four categories. The external accountant, definition bookkeeper, mm -hmm. fall into that yep, yep. Uh, external accountant view. 
And then we come on stage third, which is not necessarily council work, but it's the idea of this trust and company service from the So we've got there then that requirement to be supervised. Okay. So if you are a member of a professional body who is a supervisor authority, and there's 13 remaining supervisors for our sector. Okay. If you are supervised, if you're registered one of those bodies, then you should be able to be supervised by them as well. So go to your individual. Go to your, your go to your individual sure. no. yeah. If that's not the case, which again is probably half and half, I imagine, your default would be to go to HMRC. And to register to HMRC, the application I think now is an online process. Oh, well, no, um, yeah. Around 110, 120 pounds per registration. That, yeah. So that would be the place to go if you're not currently registered. Now, if you're not registered today and you've been in practice for a period of time, it may well be that if you went to place from RC, it would attract to find to you normally a minimum of the years you should have yeah. been registered back over the years. That's what we're seeing at the time they're charging yeah. for the years you should. I don't so, know about the individual. So it, it seems to exactly will have their own process for that. But thinking about it, don't forget, not being supervised. Is a criminal offence. Yep. So if you're paying two hundred pound extra, there's an argument that's not a bad deal. If you should have been supervised beforehand, so I was. So, so I, 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 I really want to stress that point that you made there, Richard, because failing to be supervised, as you said, is a criminal offence. Yes. Yeah, we're not talking civil offence; it's a criminal offence. So, heaven forfend that you are in practice and you haven't. Uh, notified your professional body so they have no knowledge that you are in practice, or if you're not a member of one of those bodies and you haven't notified HMRC, you know, you are at the moment in all sorts of serious problems. So, do you want to maybe get that rectified? Um, moving on, so prior to 2017 sure. for MLD, I think between 2007 and now we'd settled on the major obligations that were being placed on us as accountants. This is, this is what I had as the major obligations. We had to appoint uh, MLRO, Money and Ordering Recording Officer. We had to train, not just yeah. ourselves, but also our staff. We had to undertake client your customer due diligence, client due diligence. We had to keep and record all of that work. Yeah. And we had to have systems and controls in place for reporting suspicions or knowledge of money laundering. Yeah. Now, having read 2017 and the rest of it, um, none of those have changed. Either. They've been augmented, but they haven't actually monstrously changed. If you can look at them and say, you know, have any of those hmm. So when we're actually uh, I they have. doing our talks, we generally over the sort of last year or two we've talked about the eight steps of compliance. Yeah. We've added a ninth point to that for our talks in the last six months or so, which is the concept of just reviewing, just really highlighting these keep reviewing, mm -hmm. reviewing, reviewing what you're doing. Those eight steps will still lead you to be compliant today, mm -hmm. but there is a bit more work to do on each of those steps, basically. Yeah, so if, 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 you're compliant, if you're compliant prior to 2017, you haven't got oodles to do to get compliant. No, you will be for, largely you're compliant. Yeah. If you were compliant before the 26 of June this year, you'd like to be pretty much compliant yeah. um, as of today. There's some stuff to do, of course, but we'll touch on to those. Yeah. Come through. But the key things to remember, those eight, nine steps are still there, still need to be dealt with, uh, yeah. and still need to be... Um, the, I think the key thing you do is what I'm telling you, and I've probably to death before, I'm sorry if I'm bored to death of this, record, record, yeah. record. If you don't record the steps you've taken with your AML compliance, you might as well not do them. No. It is no good turning around saying, it's all in my head, we've seen cases that try to be a defence, it's all in my mind, it's, you know, it's all written, it's all here, yeah, it. it doesn't work. It has to be documented. And really one of the key things for the new fourth directive of 2017 race is this push of recording, yeah. recording, recording, recording risk assessments, recording your training, all those parts of that. But I won't follow that yeah. one and say, please, please, if you take nothing away today, record, record, record. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why, you know, to put a plug for your AMLCC product, it does enable you to record what you have done. I, you know, I, I talk to people going around the country and, and people saying, oh, I'm doing it. And I said, well, how are you writing it down? What are you doing? They said, well, I'm just doing it. And I'm saying, well, it's not going to stand muster if you're faced by your supervisor or HMRC when they say, what are you doing? Can you show us? And you say, trust me, I've done it. So, again, most accountants are doing lots of stuff. It's writing it down, it's recording it, they may be falling yeah, I think the, the key thing for MRCC, just to mention that, is it's, if you took MRCC as a member, you're not going to be instantly compliant on day one. It gives you the facility to store 
and the parade, the appropriate records to demonstrate your compliance. It really is about this demonstration that being seen to be compliant yeah. rather than being compliant. So that's the key thing. And it does train in all sorts. Uh, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I just want to look at some of the detail of the 2017, the relevant act. I've got to read it here because this is what it's actually called. The money laundering, terrorist financing, and transfer of funds, open bracket, information on the payer, close bracket, regulations 2017. So there's a mouthful for you. Um, the act itself, and you can download it if you want, is you know, 120 pages long. Um, and it's a darn good read, not. Um, it's 128 pages long, and it does cover absolutely, you know, we haven't got time to cover absolutely everything that's in it. But what I've done is I've picked on various sections that I feel are absolutely the most important. Um, for me, Richard, the overriding thing I got from playing through all of this was risk assessments and controls and recording. Risk assessments, controls, recording. It seems to underpin everything about it. And what was interesting was it actually says in the Act that HM Treasury are going to have to undertake the risk assessment. The Home Office is going to have to undertake risk assessments for money laundering, and every single supervisory body, all 13 of them, all 13 within our sector are also going to be having to undertake risk assessments. So I'm guessing there'll be questions coming out to you from your regulated, uh, from your supervisory body in the short term. It also says quite clearly that a relevant person, which is basically I mean the practice as it were, must take appropriate steps, I need to read this, it's important, appropriate steps to identify and assess the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing to which its business is subject. To me, Richard, that's saying every practice must have a practice risk assessment which they've got to document and they've got to regularly update and look through. Is that the one? Interpreting that correctly, that every practice needs a practice risk assessment? Yeah, so I'll just jump back again one step down, so it's a bit complete picture. So the National Risk Assessment from 2015, which came out in October 2015, was the first national risk mm -hmm. assessment. So what we'll see in terms of the satisfaction of the requirements of the Home Office and the Treasury will be a further, a second risk assessment, a second national risk assessment, which is due out, I think, to the first quarter next year. So I think it's based by yeah. um, some of next year, but basically I think we we'll expect that before then. I think work's already ongoing on that new national risk assessment. So we wait and see how that affects our sector. Because we'll talk later about old banks, but yeah. that's driven by the poor performance that was received of our sector in the first national risk assessment. Okay. okay, so the requirement for risk assessment on on the firm is definitely been very clearly documented in yeah. the uh, new regulations. There is a requirement for every firm to effectively, what you're looking to do is if you were, if someone was taking your practice on as a, as a client, you're effectively doing the job they would do to review your risk as a practice, as a firm, of being exposed to money laundering, proceeds of crime, etc., during your work. Yeah. So that would come down to now, what's interesting, which is, which is very positive, I think, in the new regulations, is there's a lot more prescriptive. Than the 2007 notes were. And within different regulations, in particular Regulation 33, it talks about the detail of what your risk assessment may potentially contain. And it touches on areas such as um, where you work geographically, yeah. the type of products you work with, the type of plants you work with, the yeah. obviously structure of business. So yeah. it's quite good. It goes through a good number of um, pages for explaining what there should be within that risk assessment. Now, that'll be a a base point. Now we're developing that into MRCC at the moment for your own firm risk assessment to develop the existing firm risk assessment to be compliant with the regulations. Yes. Clearly, a lot more detail than was before. Mm. Um, so that's pushing forward. Sure. But I think the key thing is to be sure that risk assessment is required now for all practices. Yeah. So all basically, every practice got to have a practice risk assessment. Yes. It's got to be maintained, looked at, updated. That's it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. thing. Can we bring that just on the on the practice risk assessment, the, the, the question of criminality that pops up within the, the Act? Okay. Because that also, I believe, affects your practice risk assessment, doesn't it? But, I suppose, again, two stages there. I'll, I'll ask the criminality question because that's yeah. important to understand that. So, what was in the fourth directive? Uh, when it first came out, of course, it didn't change over the two years between when it came out in June, uh, 2015, and when it was issued in, 20, uh, in the UK in 2017. 
was this requirement not to have criminals involved in the beneficial ownership, uh, officers of or managers of an accounting service practice. Okay, so what that says is if somebody is currently subject to, there's a list of criminal offences within the regulations, that if that person is subject to those, then they, they should not be approved by a supervisor, and our supervisor, yeah. to carry on a business. So basically, by June next year, every supervisor will have to have had a structure in place to have a declaration from the firm to confirm that nobody involved in a salary, beneficial ownership, officership, or no. manager of that practice has any of the relevant criminal offences currently in place. Now, again, we'll wait and see what comes out from that, how it's going to be handled. I mean, the year's going to give, I think, to give an opportunity for that. Now, like January 18th, I think, we might be on with that one. It's going to be, I think, 26th of June next year, so I believe in place. You won't be able to be in practice yeah. unless you've been approved right. by your supervisor or have at least applied for that supervision. By that date, you'll be stopping back soon, yes. basically. So, just very briefly, I'm sorry, I'll hop on too much on this. That, what's not clear at the moment is whether that will require a set format of an external report, like a criminal's record, criminal record check or similar, on behalf of the practice or on behalf of the supervisor, or whether that would be a declaration from the individual firm. Because the first thing that carries the liability on that is the individual who's actually breached that and who is actually subject to criminal offence yeah. which they have disclosed. Okay. So we'll wait more on that basically. We'll wait more on that, but if it, if it got to the point where we had the criminal so sending in a report to his supervisor saying, I'm not a criminal, yeah. um, he would be in trouble <laughs> for being a criminal. Uh, so Absolutely. It, but it, we were not sure yet whether they're going to turn around we're and say, sure how, how that would be declaration or be a formal uh, external report required. Um, yeah, moving on. We already, I think we're all used to the term MLRO, money laundering officer. Um, now the access, we've got another one here, people. We now need a money laundering compliance principle, an MLCP. So you're going to start seeing MLCP cropping up in articles and all the rest of it. It's a money laundering compliance principle. That's the person who has to be appointed within the practice. And you have to, apparently, uh, every time one is appointed or changes, tell your regulatory body whoever they are, within 14 days of the appointment or the change in appointment. So, Richard, did this money laundering compliance principle, does that differ from the money laundering point officer? Um, or is it as well as? I think Can one person have both jobs? I think that the titling probably gets slightly confusing. Yeah. That basically, the role is has aspects of the same role. So when we used to talk about money laundering appointment officer, what we're talking about really from our perspective or someone who's responsible for compliance of your firm or practice with, with regulations. Now, what this idea of a further step brought in by the regulations is this requirement to disclose this person technically within 14 days of, in theory, 26th of June. Yep. Now, we've not had any set guidance from any supervisor that I've seen in terms of how to deal with that, but theoretically that should have been in place by the 14th of yep. 14 days afterwards. Now, that obviously hasn't happened for most practices to understand that. However, that person is probably going to be the MRO, my lawyer point officer, but of course that can also crosses over with the proceeds of crime nominated officer. The nominated officer is the person who's responsible for making the SAR report, the suspicious activity report, yep. to the NCA we talked about earlier. So that person basically is going to be someone who is a sufficient seniority in the practice. Again, if you're on your own, you're effectively going to be that person and understand that. So that's the best in the practice to be responsible for all that process of money order compliance, the systems, the policies, the procedures, and the controls. Of course, the controls are very important, and making sure the process is ongoing and is being adhered to. So, you say, if you're a sole trader with no staff, you're all things to all men, I mean, you, yeah. there can be nowhere else to go. If you have, even if you're a sole trader and you have staff, uh, and you have sufficient staff of capability, etc., you could have some of your staff as. One of these. Yeah, so this, this compliance person is yeah. not necessarily required to be disclosed for a sole trader as a sole trader in the purest form. Yeah. So someone who's literally working on their own with no external parties working for them, yeah. no employees at all, literally one person on their own will be exempt from that requirement to report back to supervisors, of course, will be there anyway. Yeah. If they do have someone working for them, they have a working for then that's where they're going to say, right, who is that person? Okay. But it's important they are of sufficient seniority to be able to deal with that situation. Um, 
We will yet actually talk about screening of relevant employees. Um, what exactly are they meaning by screening of our relevant employees? I think the key thing for me there, that term screening was brought out of the regulations when it first came out. It was very unclear as to exactly how it was interpreted. Did that, did that mean some sort of formal process of checking on your staff? You have to do external records checks, etc. It's come out, I think, landed quite softly in many ways. It talks about basically making sure the relevant employees, and I'll talk about that in a second, have got the, the appropriate skills, knowledge, and experience to do the role they're doing within the practice in terms of ordering and compliance. Now, realistically, what that means. For me, it's making sure they're trained on both money laundering regulations and also on your internal firm's policies, procedures, control. Because you want to make sure they are complying with these systems. No, the best system in the world yeah. if no one complies with it. So that's important there. The relevant employee question really gets, it doesn't stand on that, the money laundering rates, which is quite interesting, but it does really, to me, point to pretty much anyone in the practice who may ever. Come across any client records, they never read anything that can't talk for client, that's the call now. What about your subcontractors? People, a lot of practices use myriad subcontractors to assist them. Um, are they supposed to be screened equally? I think if you're looking, if you're the money reporting officer or the, the, the compliance principles, that's our the MLRO uh, of our practice, clearly I want to make sure anybody touching our work knows what looking out for. If someone did work on behalf of your practice, and didn't, wasn't aware of what to look out for in the regulations, and they didn't report that to you, yep. or raise it with you, then of course you're the one at fault. And if they have an exemption from prosecution themselves, their defence would be, I was not trained in this matter. And if they say they've not been trained, no good. So we come back to the recording issue that you really need to be documenting the fact that you consider your employees to have these skills, knowledge and expertise, document the training they've been through, and that becomes again, come back, record, record, record. Sorry. Got that because I think we need to move on. We're pushing on for time here. Um, I just want to bring up, uh, which sort of gave me a bit of a jolt when I was reading it, where there was, the Act talks about establishing an independent audit function to look at the adequacy and the effectiveness of the practices, our practice, our AML, AML policies. Um, when they said independent, are they talking about third parties? Are we going to have to get third party and other practice involved in looking at my practice procedures or not? I've not seen anywhere suggested that should be a third party. My, my belief is that should be someone within the practice, most probably the MRO, sorry, MRCP, who is going to be the person who's responsible. The key thing there, the idea of the audit function is to make sure that the systems and policies we talked about and the controls are operating correctly yep. and they report back to the management if there was a requirement to change recommendations, etc. Right. Um, now most of us, I think, are used to that term CDD or client due diligence or customer due diligence. Uh, you know, being the necessity to identify our clients before we act yet. Yeah. Um, and as you know, we can do this in a veritable myriad of ways. Um, first thing, is it still the prime function for us to actually establish that the person we're talking to is who they say they are when we're talking to? Is that still the prime function? Yeah. And has 2017 actually added any more onus on us, specifically with regard to our corporate clients? So let's put that around again, because yeah. the, the level of the client due diligence or customer due diligence that you undertake on behalf of your client is going to be driven by the risk assessment. So we talked briefly about the idea of risk assessment on the firm. We now need to remember, of course, this yep. stays through from the 2007 regulations. You must be risk assessing your clients as well. Yep. That risk assessment would establish the risk level of that client being involved in money only anyway, which would then drive whether you are looking to understate your normal due diligence or in fact your enhanced due diligence on that customer. Yep. Okay, so there's still a requirement definitely to identify and verify your customers. You need to know who they are. Yep, that's an absolute the individual sure. client, absolutely. absolutely. For me, um, we do use electronic checks as a supplementary part to that, but we still yeah. rely upon the requirement to see a physical passport or driving license, some sort of third party photo ID, reliable, independent yeah. ID. If we don't see it, we don't meet the first, we'll have that verified by an individual who are happy with to do the verification process on that. They will certify it for it, send it back to us. But we believe it's very important that we have seen, we confirm the person in front of us or the client is the same person with the photo there because we've not seen yet. Electronic checks that include photographic evidence that person is the same person. So, moving on, Richard, um, as I say, um, client, you did say everything in the act is, is wrapped in on all about um, risk assessments. 
Um, and now, obviously, they're saying that we should risk assess our clients, and as you said, every single one of our clients, we should be undertaking the risk assessment, which will underpin our due diligence that we then do from there. Question for you is, do we do that risk assessment at every cycle of the work? So, you know, we've done it year one, when we're doing the next set of accounts, do we review the risk assessment then? Does it make sense to do it then? Um, or, you know, if we're doing VAT returns, we're supposed to do it every time we do a VAT return, and review the risk assessment? So the risk assessment is ongoing, basically. So oh, right. you would, if, if the client circumstances have changed, you may need to re revisit the risk assessment at that stage. Now, Within MLCC, those of yeah. you will see that there is the uh, risk assessment tool in there, and you can basically, sure, yeah. as you make a change to risk assessment, or even just revisit it to check it's correct, it will record the fact you have revisited that and will update you another sure. new version of that risk assessment. Yeah. Sure. And so anything that changes, just go in, check the risk assessment as it changes, change and moved on. So it may be once a year, there's point just doing a very quick you know, once a year visit for if you work with a client quarterly you start to change over the course of the year. And, and I was actually asked a question by a VAT practitioner who said, you know, they do lots of single one off um, engagements. Are they expected to do risk assessments for each engagement? And the answer obviously is yes if you are. Well. Yeah, they have to right. do it and there's no shortcuts I'm afraid. Um, Many of us people who will have registered with HMRC will have registered as a, uh, an accountancy service provider, yeah, or an ASP as they call them. Some of them will also register as a trust and company service provider. Um, can you run through what is involved in being a trust and company service provider? Um, because as far as I recall within the documentation, um, it was at one point saying that anyone who was a trust and company service provider also had to notify HMRC, who were going to maintain some form of register, that um, you were a trusted company service provider. Not that you were going to be registered with them, you know, you'd be supervised by them, but you had to inform them. Can you just sort of run through what is a trusted company service provider? So a trusted company service provider is, is, is kind of defined within the, the regulations what it is. It's, it's laid out, or the best place to go, I always say, is go to the HMRC website, just do the TCSP, Trust and Company Service Provider, TCSP. HMRC, look at their list of services they list to be relevant to trust company services. Probably the most familiar things you'll see will be registered office, correspondence address. Yeah. So if you provide a resolution for your clients, there you go. Yeah. So they're, they're, the, they're headline things, just to speak in the title, they're the headline things they're aware of, but do have a look at that. If you are generally doing TCSP work that is subsidiary to your main work in accountancy and bookkeeping, your Regulators body, your supervisor will generally accept that as being part of their normal supervision. If you're HMRC supervised you would, and you're doing HMR and doing CCSP work, you'll need to separately register with HMRC for those both two categories. Yeah. The other question you asked is in relation to the registration, when the regulation 2017 are putting an obligation on HMRC to carry a register of TCSP people undertaking TCSP work basically. So that way, I've not seen yet that register being set up, but there's an expectation then that there won't be a substitute for supervision. So, telling mm -hmm. it's going to be an additional requirement to be registered with HMRC if you're undertaking trusted company services and work. Okay. Um, I just want to finish up the last five, ten minutes. We're looking at this wonderful new Office of Professional Body Anti Money Laundering Supervisors, or OPAS. Um, which, are, uh, you know, the mere fact that this body has been, it's been under the control of the FCA, yeah. Uh, are we to infer then that um, the professional bodies have not been doing a particularly good job, that they now have to have an oversight body? I think, first of all, the National Risk Assessment mentioned very briefly before, the first National Risk Assessment put us as a sector in a bad light. It certainly suggests accountants, yeah. accountants as a sector in a bad light, so we were the second highest risk area for money laundering taking place in the UK, but I'm banking that was. Now, that was a surprise, I think, to most supervisors that was the case. Yeah. However, if we look back on, we just talked about earlier about how the new regulations are a bit more prescriptive, a bit more helpful to work from. The previous regulations were specifically described as being not prescriptive and open, and you've asked, you've asked 13, 14 different people in our sector to interpret those yep. regulations into how they felt they dealt with people yep. and their members. Now, not surprising that's ended up with 13 different systems, which is where the criticism might be the large part of that is the inconsistency between the bodies. Now, there's a lot more work going on definitely between the bodies, which is fantastic, a lot more working together, which is brilliant. So I'm hoping when the next risk assessment comes out, we'll see that changing that down. But I don't see at the moment they're going to step away from OPAS 
because that's something that the committee has been in place. They just issued a consultation yeah. released last night on new regulations to do a lot fast, and there's a source book documentation got that at the moment by the FCA. Again, a consultation finishes at October time uh, on that now. Yeah, worth having a look at um, the one that's out from the FCA. On the, I think this is a new, new term for us all, source book. It is, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. No, the, 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 the regulations are very much about how the FCA can beat up the nicest way the uh, supervisors and will put more pressure on the supervisors. That will in turn put more pressure on to sellers and members. Yeah, and they're saying, you know, this oversight body, I, I think they said it's going to cost a couple of million a year or something, um, and it has to be paid for by the professional supervisory bodies, isn't it? So, um, what do you reckon the likelihood of our subs are going to go up? Well, I haven't had once I look at the mass source book and discussion around that, the suggestion is there is an acceptance that the accountants us will end up paying for that to our supervisors and that there are expectations of some of that cost being passed on to the clients as well. Now, that may not be realistic, so I don't suggest I've said that as realistic, but that is what's being mentioned. Consumer account is what's been mentioned in there. Uh, so said the consultations about the costs of that process at the moment as well, but I think reality is that's going to happen. It's supposed to be in place by the beginning of this beginning of next year. Yeah. Um, the regulations are saying very much about very much stick rather than character yeah. in terms of putting pressure on the uh, regulatory bodies, the supervisors, and that will definitely put more pressure on them. Yeah. Just very quickly, I said one: the talk about basically how the disciplinary process should work for members. They talk about it being basically proportionate, persuasive, and effective. They're the three terms they use effective, persuasive, proportionate. So we're expecting whether we're going to see consistency between supervisors about what whether it be a consistent fine structure or that, we're not sure yet, but all the supervisors are probably going to have to make some changes to their own internal regulations to give them more power to, to regulate so, and punish potentially. Yeah, so it's seriously a case of watch this space, as they say. Um, and it could be, you know, maybe some of the smaller supervisory bodies maybe weighing up the pros and cons, saying how much is this all going to cost? How much are we going to pass on? Maybe they might be thinking, should we withdraw? And I'm sure it must enter some people. I it? think it's, it's a natural yeah. thought process to go through. I mean, I'm hoping desperately that people don't step no. out of it because I think, you know, we will end up with people then shopping around to find the best supervisor yeah. competition yeah. in that. So I, I do yeah. think that those supervisors won't. Hopefully, I'm walking around leave people to be exposed and have to go to HMRC as default. Um, final thing, literally, HMRC, however, mm. are definitely not included in this because obviously they're not a professional body. Mm. But are we able to say with clarity that whatever uh, strictures, whatever is placed upon the professional bodies, that HMRC will follow exactly the same? Well, they're not going to do less or more, even. The SCA so, um, document issue. Which talks about source book and covers the source book has referred to the fact that expectation that HMRC will follow the FCA pop as source book basically in the same way that the supervisory bodies will do. However, they will explain the variation from that as when it happens, but they will not be required not to see to fund that. No, it's okay, fair enough. Well, I think our time is up. With that, we finished spot on time, Richard. Um, all that uh, leads me to say is to thank my guest, Richard Sims, again. Big thank, thank you, you thanks for, for, for clearing up lots of issues. Um, if we got across to anybody who's thinking money laundering is a bit of a Cinderella thing, um, I would suggest you think long and hard. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen. Uh, remember, if you've got any questions, and I hope you found a lot of information you found this very helpful. If you've got any questions, email me at Tony, T-O-N-Y, at icpa.org.uk. I'll repeat that. Tony, T-O-N-Y, at icpa.org.uk. As you all of you, a lot of you know my name from Albury Telly, and that's why I don't use that in my email address. Um, so email me at Tony at icpa.org.uk. If I can't answer you, I'll pass it on to Richard, and betwixt and between us, hopefully we'll be able to get you clarity and answers to your questions. Thanks again, and uh, maybe I'll see you on the next webinar. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.